it's a great day to drive with the windows open. I went to the ABBA concert last Friday night. I actually was going to volunteer at, at the Regent Theater in Arlington. And when I got there, the house manager, Andrew, said, go ahead and, you know, we've got volunteers, so go ahead and go to the show for free. Now, this group, I'd never heard of them before. They're called um, Dancing Dream. They're from New York City, and when they had their intro, they had, um, you know, the original ABBA, apparently, you know, they got permission to do the, the, the video of, of all of their tours that they did, little snippets here and there, and it looked like the 70s, maybe 80s. It's kind of fun listening to that and then it kind of goes into some videos of them performing and they do a really good job of not totally trying to look like them retaining their own looks so real quickly the ABBA stands for the the names of the the four members so the the blonde female singer is I believe Ag Agnetha and then there's the blonde male who is uh, Bjorn, and apparently Agnetha and Bjorn were married, and then, um, boy, I, I, I can see his, Benny is the other man, he's dark-headed with the beard, and he's married, he was married to Annie, also known as Annie Freed. All right, so the dark-headed girl did a great job of, you know, they tried to look like them with some of their costumes, but they they were, of course, very unique to themselves. And then the girl who looked like um, Agnetha did a good job. Now, the guy who played Bjorn's part had a very different haircut. He didn't have the bowl haircut. It was kind of shaped along the sides and in the back, but he was, you know, just as good a guitarist. And then the keyboardist who played Benny's part was very good and he had a little bit of a facial hair and whatnot. And then they had a, a drummer and a, a bass player who was very good. They, they called the bass player Elvis. And so I'm, I'm going to upload the videos. The videos are taking a while to upload on um, YouTube. I'm, I'm not sure what it is. It, sometimes they're really fast, sometimes they take a few days. So. Um, I've got to up, I've just finish uploading my last 4th of July video, so that'll be out pretty soon for your perusal, and then I'll upload the, the snippets of the songs that I did for the ABBA concert. And then I had a really funny day after work that I, and I hope you enjoy hearing that story. And of course, when I start telling stories, it keeps going on and on. Okay, so when I got there, I decided, okay, it, and I'm kind of a conservative dancer these days. There, there was a time where I think, if you ever saw the movie Dan in Real Life, where um, Dane Cook's character, his brother, and Dan go out, played by, um, I can't think of him. Anyway, he's the guy from The Office. You know who I'm talking about. I'll think of it in a second. Uh, Steve Carell, Stephen Carell, and let's see, Emily Blunt plays the doctor that he goes out with, who was, what do they call her, Ruthie Draper, and that was her name, and then there's the other character played by Juliet, Juliet Binoche, and she plays Annie, so Anyway, it's a comedy of errors. So when the four of them go out, Dan and Annie are competing dancing because they, they have a secret crush on each other even though she's supposed to be dating his brother. They all have to sleep in separate rooms because they're vacationing with the family in Connecticut. And, and so, you gotta see it. But anyway, they all go out and she's a little put out that he's taken um, Ruthie Draper out. And he's, you know, <laughs> he's kind of rubbing it in her face. And, He's dateable. So, Emily Blunt's character, Ruthie, puts, I think it was, I don't remember the song. She puts this real upbeat song on, and they start dancing, and Stephen Curl does this thing where he's just, his arms and legs are flying everywhere. 
there were times where I danced and I was kind of like that. Just, and I, I'm much more, probably more like Ellen DeGeneres, you know how she's a little bit sort of conservative. A lot of people got up in the aisle and danced. And there was one lady who danced the whole time. She had um, the, the sort of the hippie tie-dyed leggings pants. And so she was up to the right and she would stand. She danced through the whole thing and kind of got people up. And there was a real sweet section. I forget which ballad it was that they sang. Another one of the volunteers went over to her. He was this real sweet man, Tom. And he, he started dancing with her. And I captured that a little bit on the, I can't remember which one it was. I know there's, uh, it doesn't matter. All right, so then they had, does your mother know? And Annie Freed's character said, if you don't dance, I'm gonna come out and make sure, and make sure that you're dancing. So I decided, okay, I'll get up and dance. I wish I had taken the, my camera out into the audience and you could have seen. So she had a lot of people seeing on the microphone and she actually came up to me and put the microphone in my face. And we're dancing and she's going, you know, and I wish somebody had had the, I actually knew the words and I don't know how I sounded. I hope I sounded on tune. Allegedly, I was on tune singing with her. And then they finished, of course, they, they got off the stage and everybody's going, what about Dancing Queen? So they came back on, they said, well, we want to do an encore. Did anybody have a request? Dancing Queen! So of course, it was just a wonderful time. And that was it. For that and then the next night I went and saw the at Sydney Sussex College Chorale at First Parish Church in Brookline and they uh, Sydney Sussex is actually one of the colleges that is a part of the, the Oxford University system and they were excellent just, there were some melodies I had never heard, and they only did a select few. I, I, I got the program, but they were they did about a quarter of them. Afterwards, we talked to, to some of them, and one of the young women's name was Italian. She had traveled to Poland. She's studying Russian and a lot of some Eastern studies, um, mostly Eastern Bloc studies, and then we talked to some other women. But she pointed one young man out. She said he actually sang, and I didn't go over and talk to him. It was, they were getting ready to leave, but she said he actually sang at William and Kate's um, wedding when he was a little bitty boy, which is really sweet. And then I went out and talked to the choir director because the young man, Avery Griffin, who played violin at our wedding, I believe, he was the, if I have it right, he was the choir director at St. Thomas Episcopal Church in New York City, which is one of the bigger churches, and they perform there. So I spoke with the choir director and asked if he had met Avery, because now Avery is over at Trinity Episcopal, and according to his parents that actually is the I think one of the largest Episcopal churches in New York City and he's the choir director there now he has and I didn't tell this to the, the choir director from Sydney Sussex but um, just so that you know Avery and his group room full of teeth won a Grammy in um, it's just in the last 10 years so he he tried out for this group they're an acapella group and they do a lot of these amazing voice sort of, uh, they, a, a lot of them might be some new melodies or melodies you recognize, and then some are very different. They sound like, it sounds like something that, that might be on a soundtrack in a movie. And sometimes you don't know that it's the human voice because it is so, it, it's, it's just amazing what they can do with the human voice. Okay, so he did not meet Avery. But that was a really cool conversation, and, and they're getting ready to fly back to England, um, I believe tomorrow is when they're leaving. But they got to, you know, to visit Boston, and of course there's a lot of, of history in common with Boston and 
the mother country which was really fun and they they loved seeing all the history you, even even some of the interesting stuff where of course we colonial now I met somebody at church uh, last week who were very funny they were talking about how the colonials were rebels <laughs> and you know had rebelled against the queen they were I think they had a, a, a sort of a British connection I don't know it was kind of funny it was, it was a long time ago <laughs> we're now allies and so everything should be good Anyway, one thing I wanted to say, I didn't even think of this till later, they were so funny, they said, well, weren't they just obeying God because wasn't the, wasn't the monarch supposed to be God? No, and I got to thinking, no, they were not a God, and they, they do not, they never profess, never have, and neither, neither has Queen Elizabeth professed to be God, <laughs> or to take God's place. They're very reverent when it comes to God, and they don't. They're much more humble than them. <laughs> this person was funny. Weren't they disobeying God when they disobeyed the king of England? <laughs> well, I don't think that they would think of it that way, especially knowing, I think, some of the things that King George had, had put some of the people through because of, of the differences in, in worship styles and whatnot. So that was really interesting. But <laughs> people are very funny. I think we do have a a freedom to worship that's what I think makes America wonderful is that we do have the freedom to worship or not worship at all and, and I did make a 4th of July video which I you know I may go ahead and upload this one instead I, I it was a little bit more than I thought but I, 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 th I thought that that was that that was brilliant what the, the founders allowed instead of coming up with a state religion instead to give the individual freedom to to worship any way that that they that their conscience so feels or to not worship at all and to not feel compelled by the state to attend church and also to not be compelled by the state to not attend church now one thing i i think was so interesting and during the Renaissance, there was a, and we talked about this in our small group recently, and it, it had occurred to me, I don't, I don't know if somebody else had made the comment and, and then I gleaned something and built on it or if I, I don't remember how it was, but here was the nugget, which was, um, I don't even know how to put it into words so that it's succinct. Let me think about it just a second and I'll get back to that in a minute. But the, the whole issue of a of, of freedom, it has to do with not compelling people to worship because of course you can't compel people against their conscience then, then they're not they're not doing it out of a out of a love and a reference for God now it's under compulsion and yeah the, the, the other thought was a little too big and if I think of it and I'm able to condense it then I will I will put it out there but I thought that that was um, okay Here's something else that I heard from N.T. Wright. And <laughs> how did we get from Abba all the way to theology? This was really neat. And I agree with this. Where he said that the resurrection was the beginning of the, the new world order in Christianity. Not as in something creepy like Nazism. But what God had created in the beginning in the garden to be good and perfect, which went awry in the garden and at the resurrection, that was a creation, not upon Jesus' second return or after we leave this earth, but that that in and of itself is beginning at the resurrection and this call to renew the earth, um, to bring the, the dis disciplines of learning forward, of, of language, art, you know, engineering, architecture, science, medicine, all of those feats which began to sort of take hold in, in if you look back in Babylonian and um, 
Egyptian times and then of course during the, the Medo-Persian, the, the Roman, the, the Greek, I'm sorry, Greek and then Roman times, of course you have all this, this, this revival and then there were of course the, the very, some of the tough years, the dark ages and the, there are some good things that did happen and some things I think in the Eastern, the Arabic world, they were developing their own systems of science and, and um, medicine and things like that. And then there was the, the Renaissance. And most of those people, or a lot of those people, were unapologetically the, theological, and they they saw a connection in between their theology, their um, who they were, and, and what they were presenting as people, or what their vocation would be. And, and actually, this does get back to Abba, because there are some very spiritual songs that they sing. And I know there's been a lot of, a lot of people kind of think, well, Europe fell off the the boat they're not Christian anymore and you know New England isn't I, I wouldn't agree with that at all especially being here now I would think it there's probably a huge Christian spiritual presence and it's much more diverse it's much more um, patient I don't I don't know that I would use the word tolerance it, it kind of smacks of gritting your teeth but I, I think it's more of a patient view of, of of those that we have um, uh, who might see things differently than us. It, it, I, I would credit the person who said this. I thought this was brilliant also. The First Amendment is for those who who have an opposing view from me. And so that's for them to express themselves to me. Not for me so much to convince somebody of, of my position, but for me to hear somebody else out and then go from there. Maybe I'm the one who needs to learn something and, um, and then of course I can present my side of things if it's a little different or whatnot. All right, I, I can't quite condense the other down into, <laughs> into a little, but what I see is this huge, if you look in pop culture, people say, oh, you know, pop culture is gone, and it's, it's so secular, it, it really isn't. If you look, I'm telling you, but, even a lot of heavy metal bands, rock and roll, but it, there's a lot of mention of, of people's spiritual walk, of God, of, you know, um, making good decisions, lots of great psychology. And I remember one time one of our ministers, I think Mike had called Tom Petty, um, sort of a, a new, one of the new philosophers, which I would say a lot of the rock and roll artists are definitely the new philosophers um, and the the places oh okay places of discourse that people might enjoy talking about subjects or writing a song about something that that they truly believe in and not just for themselves but to encourage other people which I think is really great so I think that there's a whole lot of of theology. This was the other thing N.T. Wright said, which I thought was fascinating. I didn't, I didn't under, know this. Theology was not considered a discipline until Christianity came along. Up until then, there was just this, there was a knowledge of God or of a deity or whatnot. And then there were the basic writings and then you studied within that system, whether it was Judaism or an Eastern religion or whatnot. It wasn't until Christianity came along and, and I believe what the, the what he was, the, the point he was trying to make was that Christianity um, systematically, not, well, there's systematic theology, there are all kinds of different theologies, which there's this sort of progression and step-by-step, -step, whatnot, but there are all different kinds of views on how to look at the Bible and how to unfold it and, and how do we, you know, what are the most important things. And so the idea of theology as a discipline is a uh, sort of recent, well, I think he was saying that it kind of started during the time of the apostles and then it has continued to, you know, to add to its, its knowledge base, you know, with every century and with, you know, whatnot, which I thought was really neat. Oh, and this was the other thing, and this is what I, I wish I could remember who said this, but math apparently before a hundred years ago, 
was not considered a science, I think, or, or connected to the sciences. It was considered a philosophy, or maybe it was right the opposite. It was considered a science and they didn't see the philosophical. I don't remember what it was, and, and I couldn't find the video to confirm. I, again, I thought that that was really interesting. So, and you can see how it's both, especially if you study geometry, trigonometry, because they're much more abstract. And which I loved geometry. I'm a much more abstract, complex thinker than, you know, algebra is more linear. So, um, although I did enjoy algebra a whole lot, it helped me know how to categorize things and how to write problems, solve problems, and and understand the, the proofs behind the problems and, 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 you know, the proofs behind the, the, the problems in geometry as well. Okay, so let's see, let me get back to the math. But math itself, I wish I could remember what that was. Okay, so there's reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think before the discipline was reading and writing, and arithmetic was considered a separate discipline, and then they added it to, okay, that's probably wrong too. <laughs> All I know, that was a really fascinating piece of information on math. <laughs> so if anybody knows what it is, you're more than welcome to correct. <sighs> I wish I could remember what it was. I know that it, it, it wasn't one kind of a discipline before the early 1900s, and then it became a, another <laughs> part of this other discipline. Okay, I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. My back teeth are floating, and I am where I need to get and, and run an errand. So thank you very much for listening. I'm rolling down the window again because it is beautiful. And a great day to be out. I wish you were here. Thank you for stopping by coffee. Good stuff. Bye-bye.